As you know, living in the 10% zone, very briefly, I think you've heard me say it enough by now, but it's talking about those who get it. Amen? Yeah. You know, there's so few that actually do that. Jesus prophesied it. He said there's going to be many called, but few are chosen. And, and the chosen not mean so much about what he's doing, but see, the chosen are those who have been prepared and they're ready. It's not like a selection process that some kind of think that, well, you know, they would just cut out to be that or this or that. No, it's those who are prepared. The ones that are chosen are not just the ones that show up. The ones that are chosen are the ones that are doing what they're supposed to do. And when they do that and, and they understand that, you know, God's not just uh, uh, the faith God that we hang the little, the little uh, thing up on the wall and it says break glass in case of fire, you know, and then we have an emergency, you know, mission that we need. We need an emergency prayer. No, it's those who don't use the, the, their faith that way. It's those who are constantly working on putting an edge on the sword, you know, keeping themselves ready at all times. That's the 10%, amen? Come on. And they get it. They may be part of the few, but they're the few that's going to, going to walk this earth with the blessings of God. Now, we've been talking about discovering the life that God has hidden for you, according to Colossians. That's what he said, that your life is hid with Christ and God. That's what we did Sunday morning. But that's just kind of a, of a reminder. But uh, in 1 Corinthians, we're going to look at the, the subject for tonight, and that is, if you'll go ahead and, and we'll go ahead and pull up the next, next part of the slide, we know that there is two laws. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of sin and death. Everybody say the law of the spirit of life in Christ. And the law of sin and death. Now, those are two spiritual laws. They are constant. They're continually there to influence our life. One or the other is going to influence you. You don't have anything else. There's two laws that, spiritually speaking, there are two laws that govern on this earth. The law of sin and death that was activated or it was, it was uh, well it came into being at the fall when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. The law of sin and death kicked in. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus came these several millenniums later when Jesus Christ came and ratified or he made this covenant and he instituted this law and it's how he governs in his people. It's how he rules and reigns today before he comes back after the seven years of the tribulation and the, in the millennial reign. That's not what our subject is tonight, but, but what we're talking about is this is the government of God, the kingdom of God, how it's ruled, these two laws. So one is pulling against you and one is pulling, uh, pulling the opposite way. We enter into one, the higher law, by faith, and we enter into the other one, or the other one pulls us down by fear. And uh, so we operate in these two laws all the time. One of the other is going to have an effect. I've told you in the past, I said, you know, you can't be in faith and fear at the same time. Can you say amen? amen. You cannot. You can't. Don't even go to thinking you can. What you have to do is if you have fear of anything, you have to take the word out and determine, do I believe this? And you have to dispel that fear. You have to get rid of it. It, it, it takes discipline. It takes confidence and trust. It takes more than just a religious re approach to the Word. We have to enter into that law of life that's offered by God and have all of the blessings you could ever need wrapped up in it, but we've got to enter into it. Do you see that? So this one is always pulling us away from the law of sin and death. We understand that the law of sin and death is, is, is like gravity. It's always pulling against us. Every day, in everyday life, yep. everything you do, there's always decisions that are going to cause you to go one way or the other. Amen? Amen? You've seen it. You've been living that way. You want to escape from the things that are, that are displeasing to God and the things that are, uh, you know, that, that God is, is, well, he's not pleased with. You know, but yet there's always something like Paul said seems to be pulling me the other way. And that's kind of what we're talking about in this message. Now, we know that last week we started in John chapter uh, 6 where Jesus, I mean, in John chapter 8, where Jesus said, He whom the Son has what? Set free. It's free indeed. What does that mean? Free indeed. That means free. We have broken free from that which is pulling our lives into the earth realm of, of 
labor for everything you get where you just, you know, it just, everything is just, just doesn't come easy. And see, what the anointing does is it lifts the burden. You don't stop working. You just don't have the burden of work. You're working with the Holy Spirit, with God. And even if your day-to-day -day activities, you'll find out that even the things that you once labored and you just were so hard, it's not going to be that way anymore. You'll do the same thing, but you'll do them with a different kind of power behind it. Right, because that's what the anointing does. You're still here. You're still, that, that law of sin and death is still in operation, but you're operating at a higher level. I mean, can you imagine the stress and worry of everyday life, of, of continually worried about this or that, and it's going away? You know, that's what we're talking about. You know at that point, that's an evidence that you have entered into that realm. And so there's still that that. We talked about last week, Jesus said, He whom the Son set free is free indeed. But there's one thing that you and I are not set free from. There's one thing that He did not free us from, and that's temptation. Who's your neighbor telling temptation? So that's the message. That's what is constantly trying to get us to, to stay in that realm. Whenever you commit something displeasing to God, you're going to enter into that realm of fear. All right? Amen. That's one of the causes of fear. That's one of the things that motivates fear itself. When I know that I'm not pleasing to God, then I'm not sure when I pray He'll actually answer my prayer. I'm not sure that whenever I am, I'm reading the Word and quoting the Word and all that, I am still have that little something that says, you know, it's not right. That's called conviction. All right? We've, we've lost our, our conviction and sensitivity to little things. We've kind of swept them under the rug. We've kind of surrendered to the fact maybe we just can't get over those things. Tonight I'm going to kind of run through a list. I may not preach on all of them. We may just introduce them tonight. But it's the temptations that are always right there. They're always pulling you back. They're trying to sink their claws into you and not let you go. And so we're going to kind of talk about it. But first we're going to read our scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this whole message is designed to help us to, to break free. Because when I conquer the fear of whatever it could be that's tempting me, and I get over that, man, there's a freedom. You know, how many of you have ever had something that, how many of you ever, I, I, I know a good scenario. I know, well, this is someone, I remember one time he told me, he thought he had cancer. He was having some weird symptoms and some bad things were going on. And he, he finally... <laughs> After months and months of worry and being concerned, he went to the doctor. And the doctor told him what it was, I don't remember now, but it was something simple, you know, they make a pill for that, whatever it was. And he said, man, I got the first good night of sleep I had in months. You don't have to live like that. But yet those things are tempting all the time. See, he was living with this thought, with these things that were constantly bombarding his mind. He just... And it may not be that with you. It may be something else. It may be, you know, uh, you know, the financial aspect of life. It may be raising children. It may be the marriage. It could be a lot of different things. But we all have things that are constantly there on purpose, not by God, but by the one that Paul says, the prince of the power of the air. He said he's a God or little G God of this world in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And it's constantly there pulling all right? Constantly they are trying to create things that are going to cause us to not enter into that realm. Because once you get up in there and get a, few, a little glimpse of it and experience, you don't want to come down. So, here's what he said in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 10. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And what he's talking about there is don't just get so haughty and high-minded that you think you've got it all figured out. Because you're up against an enemy that's been doing this for thousands of years. He's been doing it since the day that he got filled with pride and thought he was standing by himself and that he had it mastered and he was in the garden of God. It says in Ezekiel and Isaiah chapter 14 and he looked up at the throne of God and he said, I'm going to be God. I will ascend up to that throne. I will be God. I will leave my position here. And he just made all this declaration and Jesus said in Luke 10, as lightning from heaven, he was cast down. And when he hit the earth again, the Bible gives us a little description of how the, the hills shook lightly. 
I mean, it must have been like a meteor coming back down, spiritually speaking. I mean, he just, he went down so fast, he didn't know what happened. He lost his standing with God. He lost the anointing that God had put in his life to function in what he was purposed to do. And it can happen to anyone. He knows that. And so his plan is to try to, you know, discredit that and, you know, and well, you get out of here, maybe you'll get a little, a little taste of heaven when you leave. You don't know for sure, but you've got that hope. But he said, don't be like Satan. Don't get to thinking that you're standing alone. Don't think it's because of your knowledge or your wisdom. This is what he's talking about. He said, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Everybody say, God is faithful. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Do you know what makes God omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing? And I'm not afraid. Do you know what makes him that? You know what it makes it where we say, where Jesus said, all things are possible with God? I want you to say that with me. Say, all things are possible with God. Now say it again. All things are possible with God. Do you believe that? Come on, let's say it again. All things are possible with God. Now, with that in mind, if we believe that, what makes us able to say that? What do we believe about God that makes that statement true in our heart? Well, it's His omniscience, His all-knowing. You see, there's not one thing that's, that could ever tempt you, could ever come into your life, could ever be a factor, a circumstance, or anything else, that God doesn't already have a way of escape. There is nothing impossible with God because He knows everything that's possible. I'm going to say that again. You need to get that. There is not one thing impossible with God because He knows everything that is possible. In other words, there's nothing possible that He doesn't know about. He knows how everything works. He knows how everything is. He knows. Now, the devil doesn't match that kind of power or that kind of wisdom or that kind of knowledge. He's always got to try to figure out something. You know, a new generation comes along, he's got to try to figure out how to get them off track. And he does that with these things called temptations. But God is faithful, all right? And he says here one more time, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And that's what he's saying. There's nothing that God doesn't already know how to deal with that can happen in your life. Not one thing. We're not VIP sinners. We're not people who, who, who God is just sitting there going, man, I wish I could figure that one out. And you've heard me tell the story. I mean, I, I, I remember crying one day. Just You've heard me tell, I'm going to tell you again, though. Whining, oh, God, I got a problem. I got this big problem. I got this big problem. And I, I'm telling you, I believe it was the Holy, the Holy Ghost. And he said, is that what a big problem looks like? And I just, I don't know, maybe that was my thinking, but it really made sense because I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting here telling God about this thing, and that's nothing for God. You follow me? I mean, it's nothing. I mean, it was a big problem to me. But all I needed to do was overcome what was really holding me back, and that was unbelief. You know, I really wasn't believing. I was getting sucked down in that vortex like in a funnel that just... I was like going round and round, nowhere to grab onto and going towards this little black hole. I didn't quite know where it was going to spit me out, but I knew that I couldn't stop this from happening in my own strength. It was just pulling me down. I, it just felt that way. I'm not saying it was that, no, not physically, but it felt that way. Have you ever felt that? You know, worry just starts, I mean, you, the more you go round and round and you make that circle around this thing again, man, it just... You start beginning to say, man, I'm losing control. I mean, I can't stop this. Addictions are that way. People get in addictions and all of a sudden, there's no, there's no handle to grab onto. Their flesh has been exposed to something that it has a, such a desire for that it just won't let it go. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about addiction to drugs and stuff. I'm talking about people who gossip. They love it. I mean, it just, it, it's, such a, it's such a big part of their life. And what they do is they love it so much 
they, they love to hate it because they know it's wrong, but they just can't help themselves. Oh, come on now. See, I'm not just talking about physical things. I'm talking about things that, that just take over a human being and it just... But you can get free. Jesus has already made a way of escape, but it's going to require you to do some effort. We'll talk about that tonight. Now, so here we see this, this scripture describing something that I think is very important. First of all, we know, we talked about last week when Jesus said, he whom the Son set free is free indeed. What are we free from? Free from going to hell, for sure. Free from what? Free from the curse and everything that would describe that. Free from evil. Can you say amen? amen. I mean, when he set us free, he set us free. And freedom, I mean, if I don't feel free in an area, it doesn't matter what it is. If I don't feel, if I feel like something has me bound up, I can get free. Right. But I got to do it in that realm that's on the top up there. Amen. That's where freedom's found. That's where freedom's realized. That's where the breakthrough comes. Now here he's telling us, not one temptation that the devil can come up with, the flesh can come up with, your neighbor can come up with, your dog can't come up with one, you know. Your car can't do it. Traffic lights can't do it. Traffic jams can't do it. There's still nothing. <laughs> but you have to discipline yourself. Because God is faithful, we just have to jump on board with that. Now let me give you a couple of things. I need to wrap this up and kind of, kind of run through it. But God, he said God will not allow. That's what the word suffer means. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able now that's very interesting, you know, when you think about it. What's he talking about? What ability do I have? What ability? What, what ability do I have? I mean, you have to think about that. He said, God will not allow me to be tempted above that which I'm able. What does that mean? Can you imagine? I mean, you're thinking about I me. Mean, some of you, I hope you, you've got something going on. You're not just thinking about the roast and, at home waiting on you after dinner. I mean, I, what are you thinking? What ability do I have? Faith. That's it. That's all that's required. That's all that stands between me and victory over whatever it may be. That's it. I've got to believe God. I don't have to do the things. Come on, did I feel like I have surrendered to him with just the way it is? No, it's not. Never can think that because he says right here, God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able. In other words, wherever your faith is, God's going to meet you right there. When it comes to finances, you got $10 faith, God will meet you with that $10. You got $100 faith, you need a hundred dollars. God will meet you right there. You got, you know, you got sickness, disease. I mean, you got, you know, I'm not gonna catch a cold. Faith, you're not gonna catch a cold. I'm not gonna have a headache. You're not gonna have a headache. You, know, you understand what I'm telling you? I mean, wherever you are, if you believe God, whatever you can believe God, whatever position you take a stand on with God, not on your own, not in your own merit, but whatever position you make to draw the line and say, I believe this and I'm not backing down, let me tell you something. God will not allow that to be taken from you. Are you listening? Look at your neighbor and tell him, God will not allow that to be taken from you. So what is the temptation? The Bible tells us that a temptation is trying to draw you away from that. So, he's saying right there that God will never allow your faith to fail. Can you say that? God will never allow my faith to fail. He just will. That, that's what he's telling us. There's nothing that can pull you away from the blessing of God except for you entering into that other realm. Right there. It's either one or the other. It's just that simple. I mean, I know that sounds harsh because a lot of us been... Trying and begging and pleading and praying and fasting and, and doing it. And we've been talking and we've been speaking to the mountains and nothing's ever happened. Well, I'm trying to tell you what's wrong. Yeah. It's simpler than that. If you have faith, you have ability. And 
God says, whatever ability you have. Now what I see is I see people who read someone's book or hear someone's testimony and, boy, they got this, you know, they, they did this, and man, God put this big old manifold blessing on them, and, and I'm going to do the same thing. You don't have that ability. You read their book. You don't know what they had to go through to get that. If they, if, if they even really got it. Nowadays, you don't ever know. <laughs> he knows your ability. And God is faithful to meet you where your ability is. So what I'm saying is, start small. Start believing God for some little things. All right? Don't wait until it gets to be a big thing. <laughs> Catch it quick. That's what I wanted to tell you. First thing out the shoot tonight. What is the temptation? Is something to draw you away? Now, Jesus said this. In John chapter 16, verse 33, y'all know that scripture. It's a good one. I'll start it out. Be of good cheer. In the world, you're going to have temptation, tribulation, all the same order. In the world, you're going to have. That's where this, that's where this operates. Law of sin and death is not going to be there when we get to heaven. But it's here now. We've got to deal with it. God gave us the ability to deal with it. But here's the thing. Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have temptation, tribulation. But be of good cheer. Come on, finish it for me. Huh. What does that mean? That means that what Paul said, that's another witness of it. He said right there, there is nothing in this world that he hasn't overcome. Well, he's not here right now, Pastor. I mean, he doesn't know the challenge. Oh, yes, he does. See, that's where we got to break that religious stronghold because he is here. He's right here. And whenever something goes wrong, a temptation pops up, he's right there with me. And he's there to help me. Amen? It says in Romans, he is the one that helpeth my infirmities. Where I'm weak, he, he's strong. He's the one that helps me pick up what I can't pick up on my own. Come on, now that's what's happening. So he said, you can be of good cheer. When he said that, be of good cheer, for I have already overcome the world. Now we can do one of two things. We can stand back and say, well, good for you, Jesus. Or we can understand what he's trying to tell us. And he was speaking to us. He said, listen, in the world where I've got you planted, where I've got you rooted and grounded, where I'm leaving you so that I can live my life through you, so that you can overcome things that, that the world cannot. He said, you can be of good cheer because if you've got something plaguing you, going wrong with you, man, you can be of good cheer. Now, that's hard to do. I'm one of those that just, I, I like it better when I don't have to deal with it. Come on now. I like it when the problem's over. Come on. I like it when I'm looking back at what it was. Yeah, that's right. Take that I like that part. I just don't like to be of good cheer when I'm trying to overcome it. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm saying it's a temptation to get all muddy grubs and let worry come. Now, so we're going to talk about these things, all right? Now, I told you, you got, I got a few minutes. I need to get this out. First thing you got to do is understand the difference between freedom, the choice for freedom, and freedom of choice. You know, man says it's, come on, it's, it's freedom of choice. That means, well, I'll do what I want to do. I've got the rights and the Constitution to prove it. Well, you can understand the choice for freedom, and that's where you choose Christ. You say, Lord, I'm done with doing it my way. I need you to be the Lord of my life. I don't want to be the co-pilot. I don't want to be in the pilot seat with you as a co-pilot. I don't want to be the engine. I don't want to be the plane. I want to be, in, I want to be on board with you. I want you to take me. I'm emptying myself. I, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Put things together. Let me discover the life you have for me. According to Colossians. He said it's hidden for you. And along the way, you're going to run into temptation. Now, he said, God's faithful won't allow you to be tempted above that which you're in. So he's always provided a way of escape. So anytime you face something, you need to think about this scripture. You say, okay, what's the way of escape? How do I get out of this? The answer is always going to be the same. Faith. You've got to believe. 
got to believe. Now, <clears throat> you got to recognize temptation immediately. You got to learn to be quick. This is something, no, that I'm not going that direction. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to do that. Um, you can look at this this way, too. Temptation is a confirmation thing. All right? Temptation is a confirmation thing. It's a confirmation I'm going in the right direction. When I'm starting to break free of that one on the bottom, there's something going to try to yank me back as quick as possible. <laughs> Are you listening to me? So a temptation is something. Long as, how many of you understand as long as you're living like the world, living in the world, doing what the world does, you know, you're not in covenant with God. You don't pay your tithe. You don't keep your covenant with Him. You're not sowing and growing. You're not doing any of that. You understand? Temptation don't mean nothing. You think everything's fine. You know, you judge everybody else by, you know, by their actions and you judge yourself by your intentions. You know, you're not raising the standard. You just got yourself here where you're so high and mighty. I mean, you know, these things happen. You have to understand that. <laughs> That's a temptation. What am I saying? The enemy cannot tempt you to give up something that you don't have. He can't tempt you. That's why I'm telling you it's a, it's a confirmation thing. When I'm being tempted with something, I understand something. I have broken free from an area that may have had me locked up. Got it? So it's kind of a confirmation that I'm heading in the right direction. Now what I got to do is stay there because I've got the next thing I got to do is real quickly with that lightning fast brain of ours, I've got to think about, you know what? This would be tempting me to go back or to do this or that if it wasn't something I already had victory over. Right. Don't yield to those temptations. That's what they're there for. Right. So what do you do? I've got to know the nature of God. I've got to know that God never tempts me, but he will allow me to be tested. You understand? He'll allow it when I start stepping out of line. Because faith will bring you right back. Now, I'll give you an example of what I did. I know we did this with our children. I used to ask my children this. When I say you need to know the nature of God, that's important when, when you're facing something, okay? You're believing for something. You have to know the nature of God. I used to, I used to as, a, as a quick example, I used to ask my children, you know, Paul said I was alive without the law once, but then the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. That means that our children, you don't have to baptize them when they're babies. You understand? That's a church doctrine, you know, because they're scared, and they're, that's a fear doctrine is what it is. But see, God doesn't hold them responsible for things they don't understand. You follow me? But yet they were born with a nature of sin. What's the basic nature of sin? The first thing we see in our kids. The very first thing we see happening in their life is, as a little baby that identifies that they are have, they have a fallen nature. Now, they, it, it, they're, not, they're not accountable. They don't know the law yet. They don't know the commandment yet. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But what's the very first thing you see in kids? Selfishness. That's my toy. I mean, they can't talk yet. Boy, another kid starts playing with that toy. They crawl over there. They, yeah, yeah. That's mine. That's mine. I've been playing with that. That's the first sign that you see of the fallen nature. But they're not held responsible for that. Parents are supposed to train them up. You understand? To understand that. And listen, how many of you know that takes work? Now, let me ask you a question. When the commandment comes, that's when we recognize. I understand the commandment now. And so I used to ask my kids, why is it wrong to lie? Why is it wrong to steal? And you know, the basic first answer is always a religious one. Because the Bible says so. <laughs> if you let your kids grow up like that and you grow up like that, you're going to stay in that law of sin and death because religion won't get you out of it. So what do you teach them? Well, the written word is simply has a personality that backs it up. And that personality is a person. And that person is God. And it says that God cannot lie. And so what he's trying to tell me the commandment is, that's not my nature, that's not who I am. That's not what 
I created you to be. I made you in my life as my image. But you've got something that's of the basal nature of the fall. And you've got to overcome it. And I gave you the commandment to do it. And the commandment revives sin. And then that's when I've got to say, oh, wait a minute here. See, we look at sin, oh, it's adultery, it's this, it's that. No, there's little things that are the basic nature of the fall that we need to start recognizing will cause you to be tempted. They're, they're there. Covetousness is a temptation. Did you know that? Not just covet your neighbor's wife for his goods. Did you know that Paul brought it into another life? Jesus brought it into another life. He said covetousness. You know why people don't tithe? Covetousness. Because this is mine. I've got to have this. I've got, I need this to survive. And boy, you are. You can shout hi, hallelujah. You can dump, you can do a handstand for Jesus. It ain't gonna matter. You understand? Because you are trapped. That's just one thing. Covetousness involves anything that you Instead, that's the basic nature of the fall. Are you listening to me? Right. And it will tempt you every time to, to bail out on faith. Y'all are quiet. Good. I know when I'm touching on something. <laughs> if you don't amen, you just sit there and you just look. Oh, there ain't no little halo pop up, you know. We get all proud of ourselves, you know. Uh -uh. <laughs> don't worry, man. If you want to go, you want to take, you want to take advantage of the opportunities God has. You've got to understand that's where they are. They're up there. Uh, we can self-gratify ourselves and all that kind of stuff and be real proud of what we can do. But let me tell you something. You need to recognize what temptation is. Because the devil's so good at it, you don't even realize it's happening. Because we think we got all the big ones. Oh, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Well, you know, I don't drink. Well, I don't watch pornography. Well, I don't do this. But you got some other little things. They call them little foxes in the Bible. They represent the fallen nature that you have not given over to the Lord yet. And their temptations. And they're pulling on you because it's of that law. So I told my kids, I'll finish, I'll, I'll finish that and I'll move on real quick. I don't do nothing real quick. But that's a kind of a phrase I'm using. But praise him, y'all come on back up here and make them think I'm about finished. So, so anyway, so anyway, my kids, I would tell them, so why? And they would and invariably, why? Because that's what we start to teach them. But we never tell them why it says that. That's been amazing to me. We, we get all this, all this stuff, and we really don't tell them, why does the Bible say that? Because there is a spirit, there is a personality that backs it up, and that personality represents a person, and that person is God himself. And when I understand the nature of God, I'll understand what's tempting. Come on, somebody. I won't just make an excuse and say, well, you know, we're just human. Well, you know, you just gotta you just gotta sin. You have just yielded to a temptation to say that. Now, do we? I'm not saying whether we do or not. I'm saying we've got to learn how to start watching these little things. I'll tell you some temptations. I've got the top 15 wrote down. I'm going to run through them in a minute, but I need to finish this first. So I told my kids, that's where I was. I said, there is a person behind him, and his name is God. And God wants you to be like him. And he cannot lie, but I can. Why? Because it represents that old fall. All right? That's just one thing. And so... So what, what we're teaching our kids now is the spirit behind the word. Not just the letter of the word. Now, when your faith is, now here, watch this. Now, we talked about selfishness. Can you give me a second to describe what I'm talking about? Selfishness described, even from a child, that's the very first thing that you see of the fallen nature was selfishness. Now, when we try to exercise faith, listen to me, and I want it for me, Oh, come on now. We wonder why we're not getting things. Because we approach it with a selfish motive. What am I? I mean, I mean if I'm sick, I mean, I mean, isn't it right? I mean, I want to be healed. Well, yeah. But see, you're part of a bigger picture called the body of Christ. 
And it should be not just for you. You get to enjoy what he provided for you. I hope you're listening tonight. Because see, when you approach it some other way, then it's of that basic nature. God, I need, I need more money. <laughs> I'll never forget. I told you Sunday morning. I'll never forget, man, the first time, man, we run up against that wall. But they called me from over in the trailer. This has been many years ago now. But they called over from the trailer and they said, said Pastor, you know, we don't have enough to cover payroll. I'm like, man, but God said. And I told the person we're doing this, and I said, okay, you told me. Now let's get in agreement. I began to describe, I called my the covering, uh, Brother Tim Clark. I said, Brother Tim, man, you know, I mean, I need to be in agreement with you. He said, well, brother, before we get in agreement, what are you doing to overcome that? I said, well, being a good steward. I mean, you know, we're, we're man, we're, you know, we're, we're buying hot dogs instead of, instead of hamburgers, man. You know what I mean? You know, when we have a fellowship, you know, we're, we're doing better. You know, and he said, that's not what I'm talking about, son. That's carnal thinking. He said, you've got to give your way out of that situation. See, that's what faith does. <laughs> no, no, no. I know you don't like that. <laughs> but, but that's just the way it is. Now, Sunday morning, we're going to capitalize on some more of this besides money. It's not just about money. We're talking about giving is a principle of selflessness. It identifies selfless nature. You're tempted to go right back into that selfish nature and just look at your little problem. All right? And start praying out of, that, out of that need and you're not looking at the bigger picture. Why does God want you to prosper? Because his kingdom grows. Why does God want you well? Because his kingdom is seen and identified in wellness. Why? Because that's his nature. That's who he is. Yes. Why does God want to see you blessed? Because that's who he is. Yes. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 1, 3 where he said, I've already done it. But you've got to get your nature right. You've got to start looking at the things that are gravitating, that are pulling you down into that area that I'm trying to release you out of. You've got to get into faith. That's the only way out. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you what we've done for 20-something years now that, that is we've learned these little principles I'm trying to help you with. Why? Because there are some of you that need some lessons. And if you don't want them, I'll take them. That's myself. No, I'm just <laughs> I know exactly what to do with it. All right, let me run down through a list of them. There's no temptation taking you. Jesus said, be of good cheer, all that. Let me run down through this list, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for tonight, and we'll pick it up another time. How about that? Y'all okay with that? Here they are. <laughs> I got 15 of them. The first temptation is always flesh. Flesh. Envy. Strife. Come on now. Lust and envy, the Bible calls it. You know, selfishness. The flesh wants to please itself. Are you following? All right. The second one is doubt and unbelief. You're always going to be tempted to look at the circumstances, to look at uh, away from what God's promise is. You'll fall right in from doubt to unbelief just that quick. Fears, covetousness. You see, Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. But if we choose his life, you'll find an abundance. But you've got to activate it by faith. Or you follow. So, so fears, if you love your life, he said you lose it. Why? Because there's no way you can maintain. There's absolutely no way as a human being you will stand on your own merit and it is destined to fall. I've had it happen to me twice in my lifetime. Twice. Maybe not tonight's not tonight to tell you about it because it'll take too long. We'll do another time. Selfishness, the fall of nature, anger, sadness. Did you know sadness is a temptation? The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I start feeling sadness come, I am being tempted to yield to something that does not reveal the nature of God. Are you listening? And it'll suck you down into depression and you'll be on all kind of antidepressants before you know it. And that won't even help. Mm. Don't have time to tell you the stories to back these up. Worry. If worry is usually cause from impatience. And my faith is I'm, I'm, I'm being tested. I mean, I believe in God and I believe this word, but worry kicks in and I'll start looking for another way out. 
Worry is a terrible temptation. Symptoms are a temptation. You understand? When symptoms come, you need to grab, I mean, really quick, not, not wait. You start feeling the effect of a cold, you better jump on it right now. Are you listening to me? Before you grab the NyQuil, before you grab the, the contact, whatever it is you take, before you reach for that, man, you need to get this word. Because you're being tempted with symptoms. And if you'll, if you'll take them, the devil will deliver you some more. Circumstances. Man, anything that goes around, man, circumstantial is always a temptation. Circumstances. Man, the news media loves to report circumstances. Are you listening? I mean, it's a temptation. You, you, that'll get in you. But remember, God's faithful, and he's already, he knows. It's not, it's not beyond his ability to deliver us. Amen. Do you believe that God can deliver you no matter how dark it gets out there in the world? Do you really believe that? Well, you better learn to live what I'm talking about tonight. Because there's some stuff coming. I don't know that this world is, I don't know the church this world is ready for. Here's another one that's a real big temptation. Taking on somebody else's emotions. It happens. But man, people will call. I'm telling you. <laughs> they will call. And I'm telling you. They want you to jump in their emotions and get all hyped up and revved up. And man, you're going to take on their emotion. And next thing you know, man, you sucked into the emotion. Their emotion's gone. Now you're dealing with your own stuff. And you're wondering, what happened? Man, I don't do this. Man, I can't sleep at night. You know. You got pulled right into their emotion. People might think you're cold-hearted, man. No, I'm not cold-hearted. I mean, I'll help you out, but I ain't getting in there with you. Somebody called not just not too long ago, man. I mean, first thing out their mouth, and I picked up the phone. You gotta get up here now, man. You gotta be with us. We got this crisis. It's going on. It's getting bad. It's getting worse now. I said, who is this? They called my house while y'all on the phone. I said, who is this? They, they, so, they said their name, and I said, well. Well, man, tell me what the problem is. Boo, you got to get up here. We got to get, get you and Brother Charlie, Brother Gary, and the other. We got to get everybody up here. We got to get them up here. Now, this my diet. Dear God, what's happening? No, it's not that. It's just something else that happened to that. I said, well, well, I mean, if you can tell me what it is, I'll determine if it's an emergency. You know, let me have the opportunity. What they're trying to do, see, the temptation is to pull you in. Okay, drop everything you're doing. <laughs> I just can't play that game. Well, it's cold. No, it's not. It's wisdom. You get pulled in everybody else's emotions, you're going to live a miserable life. And it ain't even a demon doing it to you. A temptation to justify wrongdoing. A temptation to change your convictions. You were convicted about this when you first started out, but now, uh, you know, it's okay. Temptation. The blame game. Always somebody else at fault. That's also, you can identify that with selfishness. Just admit you're wrong. What did you say? How do you say it? Admit it and quit. Yeah. I hate it when you pull that out. I can't admit that. You know that, don't you? I'm admitting it right here. Don't tell me that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> The temptation to quit or give up. The temptation to get anxious. I'm telling you, all those things are part of what the enemy uses to tempt us. Amen. Stand up on your feet. We'll pick up on some more of them. You need to identify these things and recognize them. There's many others. I just did the top 15. <laughs> those are just kind of on top of my head because those are things that we, we deal with all the time. And man, you get in a, in a meeting, you get in a council or whatever, and you try to get somebody, that, this is how to get out of that? No. I want to stay in this situation. You, you think I'm joking. I'm not, man. There's a way of escape every time. And the only escape is that's it. It's not 47 hours of counseling. It's not, you know, your Bible college degree, your doctorate, or your, it's not any of that. that that's just, all that's good. But it's not a replacement for faith. And faith is the ability that God gave us. Amen? God is faithful and he's given us his faith. He's given us his word and we need to use it properly. Amen? It's God good. Can you give him some praise tonight?